الأمر بالمعروف والنهي عن المنكر abandoning ordaining the good and forbidding the evil which is practically forgotten these days in Musannaf ibn Abi Shayba Hudayfa was asked who do you consider the living dead he said those who abandon الأمر بالمعروف والنهي عن المنكر those who abandon ordaining the good and forbidding the evil that's why a true da'ya he considered them the living dead that's why a true da'ya prefers the underground than over it when he can't do amr bil ma'roof and nahi an al munkar or he's banned from it and he's willing to risk the most valuable to perform it it's such an important neglected obligation that returns upon one in dunya and akhirah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy and spare households or towns or countries from punishment if they have muslihun muslihun are people who are righteous and ordain the good and forbid the evil even if there's not many salihun who are righteous but don't ordain the good and forbid the evil وما كان ربك ليهلك القرى بظلم واهلها مصلحون but if there's salihun a lot of salihun righteous people who don't ordain the good and forbid the evil yet there's no muslihun then it's a cause of punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala كانوا لا يتناهون عن منكر فعلوا. Some people have not done inkar al munkar in a long time, not with their hands or their tongues when they're able to, and not even in their hearts. And that's how sins become the norm. Why would forms of tabarruj that are worse than the tabarruj that we read in the description of tabarruj al jahiliyyah al ula, the first pre Islam ignorance? Why would they become a norm today? Al Qurtubi mentioned tabarruj from the time of Nuh and Ibrahim and Musa and Isa alayhim salam and before the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But not only do we have tabarruj worse than those eras that are public and popular and manifest in the norm, but what's startling is that it's now considered hijab. And what some men do publicly without shame or fear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even worse. And what's startling is they're labeled religious. Would that reach that level if there was active inkar of the munkar going on? Al-amr bil ma'roof wa nahi an al-munkar is the first characteristic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned that made us the best nation. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna an al-munkar. The fashion today is to do the inkar on the very few who actually do inkar of the munkar. One may not steal. Or do namima, cause enmity between Muslims, or lie, or post that which is haram to hear or see for the world to see. That falls under the former cause of istighfar. But at the same time, he or she may see that same haram in person, or in online groups that they're involved in, or generally online, where it's become common, and they'll not forbid that munkar. When the means are available and easy before them. Some have an illusion that they may not even realize that they have. And it's that they think that online or social media are exempt from inkar and munkar. Habitually seeing haram without inkar of the munkar destroys the imanic immune system. And sins become the norm to the heart over time. And that's dangerous. When you log into social media accounts, you have terms and pledges with Allah you need to fulfill. You have the pledge of وَالنُّصْ لِكُلِّ Muslim. We pledge to the Messenger وسلم, to advise every Muslim. How many pass or see something of munkar and comment or message privately the individual? And this is online and in person. But I'm saying online because that's where it's lacking. Let them know sins they're promoting are like telling Allah, Ya Allah, my sins are not enough. I need sins to go viral on the left side of my scale on the judgment day when I stand before you. Every one of the millions who see it and listen to it, whatever it may be of the various types of munkar, the original producer lays in his grave or her grave and to Yawm din which could be hundreds or thousands or millions of years, so long as that sin is still circulating, they're in the grave getting that sin. They will carry their own heavy loads of sins 
and the heavy loads of whomever they cause to go astray. Sometimes the munkarat may be an aqeedah or in slander of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or the believers, muwahideen, the pure muwahideen who the globe loves to attack or circulate in weak hadith or words of shirk or oath by other than Allah, or instruments of the shaitan, or tabarraj, or other matters that have become so common. A person may never slander, which falls under the previous cause, but he may see it and not do inkar of that munkar, and that falls under this cause from two avenues. The author said most of this cause are rights of others, and it's the right of a Muslim over another to defend him if he's being slandered. You're not slandered, the previous cause, but you're leaving something out which is defending him. And you need istighfar from that. The second avenue is that when you see someone being slandered, you're leaving, forbidden, the evil. And that's one of the examples that he gave. Ulama in dua, muwahideen, and muwahidat are systematically slandered day and night. It's their right that we defend them when we see that they're being slandered. A alim or a muwahid, especially those with proper upbringing in da'wah, they don't really care if anyone defends them or not. But that doesn't dismiss his right of us defending him. Before we drift any further, my point is that a da'ya or a prisoner or a muwahid or a muwahida they don't care, or I should say, they shouldn't care if one defends them or not. But regardless of that, you have an obligation to defend the honor of any Muslim, if you're able to. It's a right of his. مَعْذِرَةً إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ Fulfillment of the obligation of ordaining the good and forbidding the evil. You always hear, well, they're stubborn, they're not going to listen, what use is it? The obligation is to do inkar of the munkar and ordain the good. The outcome is up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa called people to Islam who died kuffar. The question was clearly answered in the Quran. A group forbidden the evil were asked, why do you preach? They're doomed to destruction, so why are you advising them? It's useless. The ones forbidden the evil said to them, it's to free ourselves from guilt and blame when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To free ourselves from guilt and blame from not forbidding the evil and ordaining the good because they know they're going to be asked about that. Perhaps, maybe they fear Allah and abstain. So in conclusion, What's this cause? It's istighfar for matter one leaves out and doesn't do like that which is common among fulfilling the rights of others and like that of ordaining the good and forbidding the evil.